Jeff, let's start at the very, very beginning. Is, is the Rich family a musical one? How, how do you become musically minded? Uh, well, my mum and dad didn't play musical instruments, but they were ballroom dancers. You know, they went out, they one of them did lots of different bits and pieces uh, dancing. And so there was a music element there. And uh, I first got interested in drumming. I was about sort of 10, 11 years old. And I, I saw a drum on TV, turn TV on. There's this guy called Gene Krupa playing drums in the film, and I thought, that's it, that's what I want to do. That sort of inspired me. I've, I've asked many drummers this question, so don't feel mocked out. Yeah, yeah. Why drums? Because it seems like a lot of kids form bands. The sexy thing is to be the singer or the lead guitarist. It, it is, but when, you, when you're sort of 10 years old, and you, I think it's because the size of them as well, you know, going past the music shop, huge drum kit in the window, and you think, that looks great. I'd love to do that, you know, rather than just the guitar. I think drummers are their, uh, their own sort of breed as well, aren't they? You know, they're, they're a breed onto the, on their own, really. You know, so I just I just love playing drums. So, what about early musical influences? Who would be counting there? Well, obviously, as we were talking about before, the Beatles would be one of them, and then I got into people like Hendrix, uh, the Stones, that sort of those sort of bands. Um, Hendrix was my big, big influence, so I'd say, when I was young. I was in the band, we just did all Hendrix stuff. In fact, we got booked for my, my dad's uh, friend's wedding, but my dad didn't tell his friend that we only played Hendrix stuff. And when we turned up to play, we got through half a song and we got paid off, and that was my first gig. It got better after that. Yeah. So what about early bands? When did the point come when it went from being a hobby to becoming something that you knew you could earn money from? Um, I suppose when I was about... 14, 15, I got asked by this singer, local guy, if I'd back him in playing pubs in the East End of London. And it was all standard stuff and all that, and back strippers and that sort of thing, and you know, the general sort of music stuff. But it was good for me to do, because it was all t types of music, jazz stuff, pop stuff, everything. And it was great for me to do it. And, and at the end of the first gig, he gave me some money. I thought, this is good, I've got to pay for this. You know, I was like, a couple of quid, but it set the ball rolling, I think, from there. So what about a professional career as a drummer? Where does, where does that begin? Um, I suppose I was about 17, 18, and uh, I answered an advert uh, in the paper for a drummer. And it, was a, it was a cabaret band, and they were touring the, the bases in, in Germany. And we used to do five 45-minute spots a night. Yeah, five spots. I can't believe we actually did it. And there was no applause at the end of the numbers. We just like part of the furniture, really. But it was good for me to do. And I came back and then went into a club in London, did some work there, and gradually got known as a drummer in London. And it just, my career just started to go up from there, really. So it, I, th I think it's good to play all types of music. It really gives you good grounding. What about the discovery? from an outsider's point of view, of status quo. When did that name first come into Jeff's life? Well, I was working for um, a singer called Jackie Linton. And Jackie used to inter inter introduce Quo on gigs. He was a, a large in life character. And he had a band as well called Jackie Linton's Band. And, and he asked me to do some gigs with him. And we did a gig supporting Quo at the Curzel in South End. And after the gig, Francis came up to Jackie and said to him, who's your drum? I was only about 18, 19. He says, a bit, bit tasty. In fact, do you want to swap? <laughs> and that was the first time I'd met Francis, you know. And then we just lost contact and I went off to do other things. I didn't meet him until really I joined the band, you know. Tell me about the infamous unreleased Rick Parfit solo album and how that came about. What uh, Rick Parfit's solo album, I was actually doing um, some session work with, with Rhino and uh, we did an album for a guy called Tron Grunland who was a, a singer-songwriter from Norway and on the session was um, a, a guitarist, it, it was um, um, Pip Williams and he used to do session work as well as producing. And we did the album for this guy, Tron, and then Pip said to me, I might have some work for you. 
can I have your number? You're a rhino. So he took, took her number and I thought, well, I didn't think nothing of it because that happens a lot, you know. And a um, couple of weeks later, I get a call from Pip. I've got Rick's solo album, if you want to do it. You're in rhino. I said, great, fantastic, yeah. So we went down to the studio, met Rick. Songs were really good, really good songs. And it just went fantastic, really great album, really good album. I thought this is going to do well. And uh, never got released. I couldn't believe it. It just, I don't know why, it just didn't happen. But from there, the Crow thing happened because, you know, Alan didn't want to come back to the record. They needed a drummer and a bass player to record in the army now. And me and Ryan, Ryan and myself got asked to do it. Now, it's, it seems to me that for a start, I've heard two things. Number one is that the band had to reform because they still owed records to put to the label. That's right. And obviously, number two, you come back with this massive single that's not actually written by one of them. And no. I, you know, half the world doesn't know that John Fogerty recorded Rockin' All Over the World, and the other half doesn't know that in the Army Now is not a status quo song. No, no. Tell us about the, 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 the start of it all then with that. Well, in the Army Now, the, the actual song, um, I think, from what I can remember, uh, it was, uh, I think Francis picked up on it through someone else. And he played it to us and he said, this is a fantastic song, we should do this. And we weren't too sure about it at the time, but Pip did a great production, full marks. He was fantastic on it, a great production. And uh, it sounded like a record to me. You know, some songs you play at the end, you think, that sounds all right. This sounded fantastic. And it was huge, you know, and you can't knock that. When you join a band as big as Status Quo, how much of your time is taken up by putting on old albums and thinking? I mean, do you, do you, um, without sounding rude, do you, do, you, do you want to mimic John or do you want to hear what John's doing and find your own feet? When I joined Quo, I did listen to some of the old stuff because it was important for me to hear what the drumming was like on the old stuff. But I thought to myself, well, I've got my own style of playing and you want to put your stamp on whatever you're doing. It's no good copying what's gone before. So what myself and Rhino did, hopefully, was put our own stamp onto that, to that music, but give it a bit, because what, what Francis said to me was quite interesting. When we first started playing, he said, it's giving it a kick up the arse. And that's exactly what we tried to do. We just played on top of it and, and just pushed it along a bit. But you've got to be careful because Francis and Rick always push along as well. So you, you've got to sort of get that middle ground, you know. And it, sometimes it's difficult to do on stage because they were really, you know, pushing it. And there was times, of course, when they were doing the old Bolivian marching dust when it went <laughs> really fast. <laughs> so we had to pull it back even more. But uh, no, it, you've got to put your own stamp on it. You can't just copy what else has gone before without going too far the other way.